Good morning, and uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, so we're here from oh. Hudley, and we're excited to be here to speak with you. Uh, my name is Mal, and I'm a product designer. I've been working at Hudley for just over two years. Uh, so I work with product development and user experience. Uh, my name is uh, Kai, working as a computer visionary at Hudley for uh, three years, working on developing new algorithms for new features. All right, so get, let's get started. Um, so, talk for today is called the Thinking Camera and Applied Machine Learning. So, overall, we're going to talk about um, a little bit about our company, about our products, about how we do things. And if you have any questions uh, while we're talking, feel free to ask at any point. Um, yes, so a little bit about the company how uh, software empowers our user experiences. Um, <coughs> something about uh, why our next product is included a um, hardware accelerator for convolutional neural networks. And also a bit how we test and develop new features. So, a little bit about the company. Uh, Hudley was founded in 2013 by Anders Eikenes and Steinov Eriksson. So, uh, these guys um, previously we're at Tambag and Cisco, working on pretty high-end uh, video conferencing solutions that were a bit expensive and big and, yeah. Um, not for the masses, but uh, for um, the very high-end. So these guys <coughs> kind of wanted to bring this type of experience down to a small form factor for um, yeah, a bit higher masses. So, um, so now we also are... Um, a lot of experts in computer vision and machine learning that we want to use to enable this experience in a small form factor. Um, but it's also important for us to have, uh, have fun and uh, work in an agile uh, way where, uh, where small teams have a lot of freedom to do what they want. And also um, where creativity is um, yeah, important. So, um, we raised uh, quite a lot of funding already, um, and uh, hopefully we can sell a lot of products and be uh, <laughs> self-driven by next year, is the, is the goal. So we are around 60 employees right now. Uh, four of us are uh, working in R&D, so uh, software engineers, hardware engineers, and um, user experience designers, uh, industrial designers. Um, yeah, research is very important, absolutely. Yeah, so in <coughs> 2017, we uh, released our first product, the Headly uh, Go, uh, both through our own sales channels, but also with um, Google as part of the Hangouts Meet Hardware Kit, I think it's called. Uh, later on, also um, this summer, we announced um, a partnership and bundle with Crestron, so their meeting room solution. Also some other big industry leaders have uh, caught, uh, caught the interest of us, which is very interesting. So this is our first product, Hudley Go. Um, this is for scale. And uh, so that is uh, the product that we released last year. So Hudley Go is uh, a co collaboration camera, which means that it has a wide angle to enable teams to communicate together. Um, and so the wide angle field of view is uh, perspective corrected using software. And we also use software to uh, enhance the image, and that enables the camera to be plug and play friendly on USB. And so the name Hudley is from Hudley, Huddle Spaces, and Huddle Spaces are small meeting rooms for typically three to six people. And right now there are about 32 million of these rooms in the world and growing. People work in more agile environments and smaller teams but only 2% of those rooms have a video solution right now. So we think there's a huge potential um, to have our product in these kinds of scenarios. And our product also fits in a variety of other use cases, so smaller and larger uh, meeting rooms, and also on the go. So for instance, you can use the camera with a laptop and just bring your team along. And then we're about to be launching our next product soon, which looks a bit similar. 
um, it retains the same form factor, but it has a premium aluminum body. Um, on the inside, things are a bit more interesting. Um, we've been able to access, get access to a new chip that lets us do more powerful things while still using low power. And this enables us to uh, have a high resolution image sensor, um, a microphone array, and also, as Kai mentioned, a hardware accelerated CNN block. And we'll get to why we have that in a second. Um, but we're huge believers in um, our users and design thinking and that needs from users to drive the products that we make. But it's typically through software uh, that we've built these experiences. So we are also huge believers in that software empowers our products and our user experiences. Uh, so as an example of that uh, and how our design values uh, or software enables our design values, some of our values are that our products should be easy to use, flexible, and intelligent. And so some examples of how software enables this is um, our product is uh, plug and play. There's nothing to install on the host. Everything is running in the camera. Um, we have fast, quiet, instant digital zoom. And we can also push out updates to image quality. Um, we also don't have any mechanical motors for um, optics, so we can retain a small form factor. Um, we're platform independent, so both, uh, it doesn't matter if your laptop is using Windows or Mac, or if you're using Skype or uh, Hangouts to make a call, uh, the camera works with everything. And also, we don't have to rely on the host hardware to deliver a consistent user experience. And then lastly, our products are also intelligent because we can push out updates, um, and uh, we're also working on smarter features in our camera where the camera can see and understand things, uh, count people, understand what's going on in a room. And to give you a better idea of that, here is a video from our marketing department. This is Hoodley IQ, a very smart camera for video meetings that helps make communicating easier, more natural, and just better. Here's how it works. This is the Hoodley experience. That's what you see when you use IQ. And this is how IQ sees your world. IQ can understand its environment. It can see people. And hear them too. Normally, if you want a camera to focus on the people you're talking to, it's a complicated process. But IQ does it all for you, automatically. And if your environment changes, IQ will adapt and respond. But best of all, IQ will get better over time with more new smart feature upgrades. Hoodly IQ, like a camera, only smarter. Okay, so a little bit about why we have included this um, hardware capability around convolutional neural networks in our next product. Uh, so we've seen that um, in the recent years that big data has enabled building more and more complex machine learning models uh, called deep learning, which can uh, make use of all of this uh, data to enhance the performance of the models. So we, of course, want to utilize these new technologies to provide the best user experiences that we can, can deliver. Uh, and having all of the all of the software, uh, all parts of the experience run inside the camera, is important. We think to give a fluid experience. <coughs> so, I just wanted to touch on some of, uh, some examples that we think are pretty cool uh, in regards to uh, deep learning and what they can do. So, here you can see uh, object uh, detector, which is used to uh, classify objects and localize them in uh, images. Um, there's also uh, stuff like uh, gaze detection, which can uh, give us information about what people are interested in, so what they are focusing on. Um, another example is uh, image captioning, so combining some sort of uh, convolutional network with a um, language model to produce a uh, textual description of what is happening in uh, images, which uh, is also an example of how to sort of draw understanding and the context from um, images. 
Um, other examples include stuff to enhance uh, image quality. So here you see some examples of image super resolution, which can add some additional detail that was not already present in the image. So the network will actually uh, add some uh, extra <laughs> detail from what it's learned previously. So this cannot actually be seen in images. It's added uh, afterwards. And you also have stuff like denoising and the uh, deblur, uh, yeah, other techniques of enhancing image quality, which are, we think are pretty interesting. Uh, so since I mentioned it a bit by now, so I just want to say something about what, what these networks uh, do. Um, so they were primi primarily designed to model uh, images and work the same way our um, uh, yeah, our sensory processing related to images is. So it was modeled based on the visual cortex of some animals. And what was seen was that uh, there is um, a local connection um, down, uh, well, uh, local receptive field, meaning that uh, next, next layer of processing uh, has not um, the complete overview of the input. It's only uh, local. And that is because images have a local correlence, uh, correlation, uh, where um, uh, yeah, individual parts of images are uh, independent, but there's also a um, global statistic that is um, seen across uh, different sets of images. So objects and things are um, not bound to be in a specific location. They can be anywhere in the images. And that's also why um, these features that are computed in each of the neurons is also computed across the entire input. And that's why I um, usually call them filters. So in each layers in convolutional neural nets, you have a filter bank, a series of filters that are computed uh, across the entire input. And when you go deeper into the uh, network, uh, um, the later stages can combine different filters to produce new concepts of shapes and uh, angles and all the way to the end, uh, combining um, different features into models of objects. And because uh, learning is um, training these networks is done completely end to end, uh, these architectures are very generic and can be trained to do almost anything, any predictive uh, task. So the everything you need is some inputs and the desired output of the um, inputs or examples. Uh, also to note here that um, changing the behavioral network, changing the task is simply just changing the parameters for these different uh, filters. They're very easy to adapt and to make, make them do different things. So um, edge computing and uh, why are we relevant? Well, we do all our computation inside the camera. And we have a very powerful um, processor that can um, compute a lot of um, um, uh, yeah, compute a lot of uh, different things in order to uh, enhance this user experience that we want to produce. So, but uh, computing on the edge um, is basically the philosophy that um, whereas you have um, utilized uh, cloud solutions in order to um, um, process uh, inputs in a centralized way um, and then send sort of the results of that back um, has been a way to have yeah, built a lot of services around that. But uh, certain types of uh, interactions um, require um, a certain degree of um, uh, well, a certain amount of fast or uh, latency free uh, communication. So I think, for instance, uh, voice assistants or types like that, if they're ask something and it kind of gets sluggish and you wait a few seconds and already you're kind of tired of this and you don't want to use this. So you have to be very fluid, uh, these type of um, interactions. It's also very secure to do processing on the edge because um, the actual data that you are capturing doesn't need to be on the internet uh, at all, at least not in the raw, raw sense. So um, whatever you would do in the cloud, 
you can move it to the edge, you would save a lot in bandwidth, and um, it can be very sensible for certain applications. Um, <coughs> so what's also uh, very, very cool about this, we think, is that um, we're excited about um, being able to provide our cameras a platform for other developers and integrators to provide their own experiences using our product in the future as well. So it doesn't really need to be uh, tied to video conferencing at all, but uh, anywhere you would need to analyze um, video, uh, real-time video. So um, that's also why we think of us as an AI camera. All right, so you've heard a bit about our company and how software enables <coughs> different experiences, and also about our hardware. And so now we'd like to show you an ex a specific example of how we've been developing smarter features um, uh, that are based on deep learning. Um, so we're big fans of design thinking again, and we want our users and opportunities to drive our uh, products. And one of the opportunities that we saw early on was that users don't always need the full wide angle view that our camera has. Um, and manually having to control pan, tilt, and zoom during a meeting is distracting when you're talking to someone. So the question we were asking was, how could we automate this process? And that feature is something we've called auto zoom. Um, and auto zoom automatically frames people in the meeting for the best uh, video experience. So we're going to go through how we came up with AutoZoom. And uh, essentially, the camera right, sees the entire field of view and can decide what the user should see. Um, but there are a lot of uh, challenges around doing this. For instance, um, you want the experience to uh, be very reliable. Um, once a user gets the wrong output, they won't trust the feature anymore, right? And uh, there are a lot of different things you want to account for. People have subjective opinions about what they want to see. And um, uh, you, also want, uh, the you also want the feature to be advantageous so that it provides some advantage to, to what the user can manually do. And so in a sense, we kind of work through a, an iterative uh, cycle working from a prototype to a product. Um, and one of them was going, starting with, with making mock-ups, so just videos of what the experience, meeting room experience could look like. And once we had feedback on what could look like and that people actually wanted this, um, we can move to building prototypes. And these were built using conventional tools so we could get up running fairly fast, so just on a CPU on a computer. And we also were able then to try out more classical computer vision tools. Um, and we got feedback that those might not be sufficient to give a consistent user experience. And um, once we started playing with uh, more advanced models on a GPU, um, we were able to get a more consistent experience. And we could also start to um, emulate what we would have running on our camera um, and then at the end, moving features to the camera. And throughout this process, we realized that it was quite difficult to evaluate experiences consistently. You'll have users saying, oh, I liked that experience in my previous meeting, um, where the camera zoomed in on this or that. But you won't actually be able to go back and see that experience. Or you might, but you also have to account for all these other scenarios. So we built a tool set around this to consistently be able to evaluate user experiences across many different scenarios. And by having that in place early, we could also ensure that as we were progressing from mockups to CPU, GPU, to the camera, that the experiences were consistent or improving. So to create this auto zoom experience, at the core we have a detector, which we're using some kind of AI technology to tell us what and who is in the meeting. And then together with this, we have what we call a frame, which is more logic-based and uh, basically decides a more predictable output of what the user will see based on the information from the detector. And then around this, we have what we call a scoring server, 
which is evaluating the AutoZoom experience across a data set of different meetings and scenarios that we wanted to cover. And so that scoring server was giving us objective feedback about the <coughs> overall uh, progress we were making. Right, so a little bit about this uh, workflow we sort of settled upon after developing this feature for a while. So starting off, we, have, um, we had this uh, idea that we needed to uh, capture the different sets of scenarios that we imagine our camera was being used in. And um, that is then uh, what we would uh, want to compare uh, against different versions or changes we do to the algorithms, uh, and also to get some sort of objective uh, metric of progress over time. So what we do is take these uh, scenarios and um, and score them using a scoring algorithm, uh, which can give us some um, objectiveness about the quality of the user experience. Then we would also um, rate or a subjective um, evaluate or user test uh, the uh, results of uh, this offline processing of this, uh, these videos to see if we are actually measuring the right thing that we want. Um, and based on that, we can make uh, required or um, required changes to either the uh, algorithms or the uh, data that we um, have collected. So that could be um, like using a different set of detectors or some parameters to our um, user experience. Uh, we could um, change some data or yeah, it could be different things. But uh, you need to go back and, and score and see how these changes do again and, and so on. Um, so you can say just a little bit about uh, how we collected this data. So um, of course we, we needed to use our camera for, for this, and um, we uh, we wanted to make the um, the data as as close to the real thing as possible. So we would record actual meetings, and um, in different scenarios, so it could be one or two or several people in different sets of um, situations. Um, different type of, uh, of, uh, of work and um, doing different things in the meeting. So, uh, and then we would uh, label all, um, all positions of every people in all of the, um, in all time points of these uh, videos. And from that compute some um, desired or some visually most pleasing way of framing the uh, video at any point in time. And from that, we could uh, compare the output of our algorithms to these um, labels for these videos. So we can say um, a little bit more about how we do that. So here you can see uh, some output of our algorithms in red here. And so it was the desired field of view, the pan tilt zoom values in red, and the um, sort of calculated or desired field of view in green. Um, <coughs> this is sort of an early um, example, but also shows uh, how we can deal with um, inaccuracies or, uh, or faulty results from the detector here. So we can just try to play this. Yeah. So you can see that the uh, labeled output here in green uh, like changes all the time because that will be the ideal framing only for that time point. But what we want to, to score or optimize is um, both being as close to this as possible, but also doing as less, uh, the less amount of changes to the pantel zoom values. So from this, we, um, we designed uh, sort of a cost function associated with this in order to um, optimize for the particular experience we want. So not to go in too much detail here, but essentially the scoring would take in the algorithms uh, f, its parameters w, and the data and labels x and y. So this uh, scoring is calculated across uh, all the videos, and um, sort of the inverse of the cost, which is uh, it's only the parts here that are interesting. So it's uh, one cost associated with doing a um, change to the zoom, or change to the field of view. Also, a cost associated with not being as close to the optimal framing that you would want. 
Uh, so these are sort of in balance because if you were to change more often, you could be closer. But if you uh, then you would also get extra penalty. So this sort of needed to be balanced. And also there's additional costs related to not having a meeting participant included in the field of view. So having this defined as a cost function, we could also optimize these uh, algorithm parameters based on the scoring. So doing a sort of a type of search uh, called optimization, we could find a set of parameters that was suitable for the particular implementation of the scoring function. And some <coughs> benefits of this is also that uh, we could um, integrate this into our uh, CI system. So for every piece of change we do, we could uh, score across all these videos and get, get feedback if the change was good or not. So only merge uh, what is good, of course. And also uh, all processed results we would upload to a server solution, a cloud solution, where we could view the results, sort of access the video and see what was happening in each, each case. So, um, of course, then you also can track performance uh, over time because you have all the commits, all the changes, and also the score. So, um, this is also important to uh, quality assure that the final implementation is going the way you would expect. So, you would need to um, make sure it's absolute. Um, feature or um, implementation all identical. It could be a little bit different, but as long as the user experience was at least as good or improving, then that would be OK. Yes, so you've seen how scoring the videos helped us keep track of how we were overall progressing. Um, but how did we know that the score itself was good for a user experience, right? So that course comes from user live user testing so live user testing gave us people's personal feelings about how the videos looked and so this was part of our workflow to ensure that the scoring was accurate and that we were weighing the different costs um, correctly so we really thought that um, combining live user testing and the video scoring um, was a really good approach they kind of complement each other because you both get the subjective feedback and the objective feedback. And um, live user testing also lets you uncover um, things that you might not have in your data set. Right. For instance, um, our CPO was bald and wasn't seen in any of the videos. So <laughs> we kind of added, had to add that to our test set, right? Um, and, and of course, there are different meetings and scenarios that you just might not have or opinions that you might want to um, add to your scoring function. Um, so we think that this way of working really worked well for um, our auto zoom feature, but probably also could work for a lot of other uh, user facing experiences. And so the improvements or the feedback could help us improve on many different aspects. One is changing the algorithms for how we're framing things. One is changing how we're scoring things. Another thing is adding additional videos or scenarios that we needed to cover uh, or bald people that we needed to test against. And, uh, and then, of course, for models weren't working, we would have feedback that we needed to, to retrain those as well. So we believe that this development workflow has really worked very well, um, where we collect data, we process and score that data, um, we get user feedback, and then we make any improvements and go over again. And also, it's important to note that user evaluation takes a lot of time and isn't necessarily, um, you don't need to do it in every single cycle. So perhaps sometimes we would get feedback and we could work between making improvements, adding data, and scoring in smaller cycles until we needed to get more user feedback again. So that's all we have for you today. Um, we hope that this has been interesting to you and I hope that it can apply to some other use cases. Um, we think that having the right tools and building the right workflow
can be kind of a, a long process, but um, looking back at what we've developed, it's been very useful and has really helped us um, work faster um, in the long run. So thank you. Um, Thanks a lot. We will um, be here to take any questions. I guess we can take some questions now and then please come up to us during the conference. We also have some uh, cameras if everyone wants to come up and actually look at them. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Questions? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, one at the end there, maybe first. Yeah, I'm just curious about how you go about manually labeling the data for training, to get your training data together. Is that something you do in house or do you outsource it on Amazon Mechanical Turk? Or yeah. What do you do? Well, at the start, we was using uh, some modified versions of an open source annotation tool and using that actually ourselves because uh, we were thinking, ah, that's going to be this, that's going to be so much data, we can probably just do it. But uh, yeah, later on, we also uh, outsourced to um, Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, use that as well. Um, the quality is not really perfect, so you would need to do some manual work as well, but uh, that's helped a bit with that. Yeah. I think there's also one, yeah. Could you just say a little bit about the sort of tools and the techniques and platforms and things we're doing around the machine learning part? Yeah. So uh, originally we would um, uh, have like a well, we try to make a uh, computer-only implementation, of course, of these uh, features. So there we used a lot of um, available tools uh, online. Uh, so I think um, we used something called Dlib for quite a while, because it was very um, uh, not dependent on a lot of things and had all the stuff we cared about. So we used uh, like a pretty regular histogram of gradient-based uh, detector to start. It was not really performing that well, so we kind of moved away from that. But um, uh, yeah, and we also used uh, like TensorFlow and Cafe and stuff like that for um, the GPU-based implementation later on. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of the logic uh, and, and that kind of stuff was based on uh, JavaScript. Um, so we kind of had a, a few different technologies uh, being combined into one, one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Also, there's um, like having implementation on the camera. We would need to like communicate um, data and like um, the quality assure the different implementations with our scoring system. So which kind of need to be integrated with every different uh, part of this. Yes. I'm not sure if you can disclose this, but the CNN we used the chip. So you said you used an yes. special chip or can you just yeah. Oh yeah, the chip. Yeah, it's called uh, Mirad X. So it's a quite new um, processor developed by Movidius, uh, recently acquired by Intel. So it has um, a lot of um, uh, vector processing cores, as, uh, which are more generic, and also um, a specific hardware component um, specialized for um, convolutional neural nets. Yeah. Hubley has kind of an interesting history with them because uh, th we've been working with them from the start and, uh, and our first product was kind of delayed because they were delayed and all this. So we're quite lucky actually to have built a relationship with them because there are only a few other much larger companies that, that have access to this Myriad X. The architecture is pretty off the shelf, so we've done some uh, adjustments based on our needs. But it's um, it's very, uh, I would say, uh, ah, it's pretty similar to what you would find. Which, which, one, which one is it? Uh, we used a few different ones. Uh, one called um, uh, SSD uh, is one we tested with. Uh, one called uh, YOLO. Um, 
some experiments with uh, incep uh, inception net or what it's called, like the rest net. Yeah. Yeah, some different ones, but um, so our uh, hardware is pretty uh, generic in order to um, support a wide range of these architectures. So. Um, Yes, so and we would uh, we would see that uh, regularly yeah. uh, with time. So, uh, but that uh, that feedback would go back to our uh, sort of our workflow. So we could uh, do some additional efforts in data collection or investigation, or was it's not uh, really ha happening as it should. And uh, it's just more and more cases you need to fix. Basically, it's not uh, really a final answer to to solving that. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, <coughs> can people get frustrated sometimes if you wanted to show something and it was not framed? You don't have a, um, a like an interface to manually do the framing if you want to show something here, for instance. Right. Uh, <laughs> yes. So we have an app that we use for controlling this. So this has the the manual controlling and also the automatic. And so what many would do is just turn off the automatic when it's not uh, working. But of course, then we would not get the feedback we would want. But it must be difficult to parse these sort of feedbacks where um, ah, it was not working. Uh, I was sitting here, and then it, uh, then I just turned it off. So I was like, uh, <laughs> you need some. Um, yeah, it could be hard to reproduce these cases, right? With some. some uh, By the time you get the feedback, it's usually too late already. So you have to go yeah. back and try to reproduce things. Okay. But there's a manual override, yes, so you can turn it off. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So you're collecting the feedback in logs, or how do you, I mean, how do you know how things work at the first time? So I think most of it goes through uh, more qualitative user testing. So, so it's more specific focused, um, and we think that kind of works. So you kind of have a large data set, right, and then you look at a, a few different offices, a few different users that we work closely with. Mm. And we go visit them and <coughs> try to replicate things if they're, if they're not working. Yep. But uh, I think it's better to focus just on a few mm. people than try to, to cover everything. So mm. hopefully we'll cover 80% of the issues by yeah. focusing on a few people. Mm. Yeah. Also, we're kind of forcing everyone in the company to use it. Yes. So th they kind of have to give us mm. feedback they can't in turn uh, it off, actually. various <laughs> uh, ways. <laughs> Yeah. What's supposed to be working <coughs> for for you uh, on your laptop, as, as you were shown on this one picture? If it works on your laptop, yes. Because like one one person is is a, is a good fit, as well as like a yes. Piece. So we wanted to oh, yeah, cover yeah. that as well. Because like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. we really want to avoid where people start turning it off, because once <laughs> you've turned it off, you, you just right. right then you've kind of failed. So uh, we want to cover every every kind of scenario. Yeah. I follow up on the bold man problem. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's really a diversity problem, isn't it? So, and you're, you're based in Oslo, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, are you collecting all your training data in Oslo, where most people are, you know, ethnically nor Northern European, or are you collecting data in China and Central America and other yeah. places? Yeah, we're kind of limited uh, in uh, having real world footage from our own camera. So we kind of need to record that ourselves. Um, but when testing with this and uh, seeing what's not working also in the live live uh, testing scenario, 
uh, we can look other places for um, collecting data to use to train our models. So for these testing videos, we're not really using them to train our models. It's just for um, uh, testing and just uh, evaluate the relative performance over time. Yeah. And just another follow up. Have you thought about now that your, your product is launched, you could also ask your user, can we take some snippets and sort of store and push this data back to our server to increase your training set, right? Because people will buy your cameras and use them in many, many different situations, but you won't necessarily replicate those situations in, in your office and when you're doing this. So if you collect some of the data and say, like, we want to capture some of these scenarios, then you can train your model on more data. Yeah. So we thought about that, uh, and we actually would uh, require to record some video, actually, <laughs> or some sequential uh, footage. And that's actually uh, maybe a bit hard to do uh, all the time. But uh, we thought a lot about it, and uh, it's made a, a bit more difficult now. But uh, we sort of want to at least provide some additional benefit to the user uh, if you were to do this, so we're not just uh, yeah. So I think it's a, a really good idea. So, um, I mean, a lot of our end customers are concerned about security and all this, right? So it's kind of hard to do it with them. But we have some other technology, uh, well, friends, basically, that are kind of part of a beta program and can give us more information. So we've definitely thought about, can we um, collect more data with them? So it's yeah, yeah. under consideration. Could use university. Yeah. There's a lot of diversity when it comes to people from different countries, yeah. like students. And if they if they like to be in both schools. Right, right. Yeah. It's a win win, right? Mm -hmm. could yeah. use it That's the good, a good idea. Yeah. The difficult part is sort of maintaining these um, sep these separate products which uh, sort of needed to be used for um, collecting and then managing and following up and that sort of thing, but it's def definitely possible to mm. yeah. But I, I would expect that the issue of facial recognition, it's sort of generic. There are a lot of companies that already have to do this. Is there like a body of knowledge or a body of data that's already available where there are already facial recognition models or did you have to start from scratch when you did this? It's uh, yeah, very, um, very much data available uh, for that, yeah. But uh, I guess it's sort of how you train as well, that uh, you can't be sure that it really uh, learns everything, and um, we sort of can't, can't use uh, the uh, absolute best that is available either. We kind of have some performance um, requirements uh, we need to uh, tackle as well. So um, we kind of want to adjust for every type of failure that we see. Mm. A very simple question: What does it cost? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. um, well, our current camera, so we haven't actually released this camera yet, but we will very soon. Um, and auto zoom as well is part of this, this camera. So the previous camera cost uh, 499 euros, dollars. Dollars, I think. I think right? yeah, or right. either or, depending on where you are. Where can you get it? Uh, you can get it from hubly.com. Uh, hmm. um, or you on can Amazon. Get it through the Google <laughs> package or Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. And then this one is going to be a bit more. I don't know what the final price is. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably more than 500 uh, USD. How, uh, uh, how long does it take to, to train your system based on a particular set of inputs? Um, it can vary a bit, but uh, for our current training um, sort of setup, uh, it usually takes about 24 hours, something like that. A bit less, like 20 hours. Mm. Yes. So how do you go from the train model and actually deploy it on the product itself? Uh, I don't think I catch the first part. Uh, so how do you take the train model, which you train on the server, presumably, using Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah we have some um, uh, some tools related to our chip producer that we use, and also some internal uh, tools uh, for that. So yeah, some of it we have to do ourselves, but it basically 
uh, translating this um, model definition you would have in like TensorFlow or something else to um, something that the chip understands. I don't think uh, you know the answer to that one. <laughs> I think uh, actually close to 100%. Uh, or it's uh, it's pretty. Uh, it's more about the using a uh, lower amount of the chip, I would say. Uh, so you're reaching the limit of what this chip can do. Sort of, yeah. But it's it's not only like uh, they use all the silicon. We also have um, some power targets and stuff to uh, to meet as well. So, um, yes, yeah, we're pretty early on as well, so there's always things we can free up, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> At least that was the case with our previous camera. Um, so, yeah. mm. yes, yes. so, how much uh, how much power does this use, and how much heat does it take? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you have the answer, can you talk, sir? <laughs> uh, so, the USB 3 uh, specification allows up to 4.5 watts. Uh, power consumption, mm. and we are somewhere. We don't really know exactly because it's not finished yet. But it's somewhere below that, obviously. Mm. Uh, and the heat dissipation would be, of course, all all of those 4.5 watts need to be dissipated. So I'm not really sure, but what the I mean, the surface temperature you should certainly be able to hold it. That <laughs> even when it's been operational, that's kind of the, what I know right now. Mm. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, you probably know the spec of it. You mean like... Um, What's the TDP of the... Uh, oh, TDP of the chip yeah. itself? Yeah. Uh, I actually don't remember. But uh, it should be able to look it up. Um, yeah, I, easily, I guess. Yeah, we can check later on. So what's the most, when you're training this, what's the most spectacular failure you've seen in terms of <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what the camera chooses to uh, uh, Like I said, I think the most severe thing uh, was uh, we had uh, huge problems with shares. Because um, um, I think most of our data had uh, like shares in close proximity to people being um, um, yeah, sort of fed into the classifiers. So we have these strange was chairs, though they look kind of like people. Yeah, that as well. So but uh, yeah, so a chair would easily be um, yeah, falsely detected as a person and stuff like that. Yeah. Anything other co that comes to mind? What? No, not right now. I mean, our CEO was, he puts his hands behind his head when he's in meetings. So he would just disappear as soon as that happened. <laughs> yeah. the meeting. Don't so, feel too relaxed. Uh, so we have to add that to the test set. Yeah. But, uh, but I think it's a really good point that you made to, to really have to consider, you know, different types of people and uh, ethnicities. Uh, it's really crucial because once somebody isn't included, they're obviously going to feel very offended. And also, <laughs> and also in a kind of startup context, old people. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, right now we're, we're missing children, so we need to think about young people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes uh, I saw in the video you detected other objects from people, trash cans, and whiteboard, and so on. Yep. Uh, you have rams to use that? Yes, uh, actually, but um, it's just uh, a little bit more difficult to test, I would say. But uh, we're trying to draw some context from that as well. Uh, and I guess in, uh, in the long run, uh, trying to figure out more about the context of what's happening based on that. Uh, how do you cope with the uh, portrait detection, say a picture of a face <coughs> on the on wall? You detected that the portrait is not real. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, I can't say that we're sort of completely, uh, <laughs> completely. Uh, yeah, failure safe in regards to that, but um, uh, I guess I can say we, 
we actually use uh, person detection, not uh, face detection, and uh, there's certain limits about the size of the um, people being detected, so that could help as well, I guess. But um, having a very large portrait photo in front of the camera would certainly be a difficulty to sort of handle right now. Yeah. Uh, how do you handle if people are standing next to a presentation or a whiteboard, or do you manage to frame the whiteboard as well with AutoZoom, or is it just a person for now? Yeah, that's um, in the works. So you're working with um, sort of different sets of whiteboard related features um, from now and uh, to the future. This will probably be um, included in some sort of software updates later on. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. but for now, it's just people. So you have to turn yeah. it off and make an adjustment. <coughs> so we're focused on getting that piece done first and then seeing what yeah, we can do otherwise. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I guess we're uh, done. Sort of out of time, anyways. But, uh, <laughs>